Well, good, morning. good morning. It's good to see you all today, and especially the uh, McCulley's back with us from California. Glad that you had safe travel back. We were all praying for that. So wonderful for all of us to be gathered here together to praise the Lord today, to worship his name, and giving him glory, hearing about the wonderful things that he has done for us and responding as he has called us to do uh, by glorifying him, enjoying him, delighting in the goodness of our God. Uh, we will do that, Lord willing, as we worship today. And then uh, by way of announcements, as you see on the back of your bulletin, we will have a uh, brief meeting. That is, uh, unless we have some lengthy debate, we'll have a brief meeting after this uh, service and after the second service for the purpose of voting on the 2021 budget, as well as the treasurer for the year 2021. And so that is uh, something to look forward to as we get ready to, to meet and to vote on those two items. Uh, the second notice there on the back of the bulletin is that we have now resumed evening worship. We were able to uh, get back into 1 Thessalonians last week. We're in chapter 3 at the moment. We will be picking up there again this evening. So if you're uh, available or want to make yourself available, come and worship with us tonight at 6 p.m. It is good uh, to praise the Lord morning and night. The uh, third announcement, just a reminder and an encouragement uh, to join us for the weekly prayer meeting. If you're able, on Wednesday evening, uh, we gather here at 6 o'clock. And if you want to bring some food to eat, you can have your dinner at that time. Some just like to come and fellowship with one another for a few minutes. And then at 6.30, we have our devotional and time of prayer. And we are currently uh, working through uh, a book called Theology. I know I announced that in the second service. I don't know if I did this one last week. Uh, but I'd encourage you to come to that good, hopefully for adults as well as for little ones. It's a, it's a 72 chapter book. We're just doing one chapter a week, uh, one page per chapter. And essentially it's a systematic theology, but written for families to use. And so we're using it together as a congregation. And it's very well done, written from a reform perspective, very solid and very plainly explained, beginning from, of course, the doctrine of God all the way through doctrine of salvation, the church, uh, all of it. And so really wonderful for us to have the opportunity to work through that together. I'd encourage you, if you're able, on Wednesday evenings to come and learn together as we lay those foundations for our faith solidly in place. Uh, those are all my announcements. Does uh, anyone have anything to add to that? Have I missed anything? All right, then. Uh, well, we'll begin today, then, as always, with our call to worship. And you can find that inside the front cover of your bulletin a responsive call based on portions of Psalm 73. I would invite you, if you would, to please rise for that call to worship. <clears throat> o Lord, whom have we in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that we desire besides you. It is good to be near to God. Amen. We got there. Then let us worship him this morning, remembering and rejoicing in all of his wonderful works. Would you join me as we pray together and we ask him to strengthen mind and heart through faith that we might go forward and live for him. Our Father in heaven, you are the only living and true God. You indeed reign in the heavens, over the heavens and the earth. And we have none besides you. Besides you, you tell us there is no God. Besides you, there is no Savior. You are the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord, the Almighty. And to you belongs all worship and glory and honor. To you is owed the, the devotion, the obedience and praise of all the works of your hands. We are here, we gladly confess, to glorify and to enjoy you, to learn how wonderful you are, and of the great deeds which you have done, your wonderful works, and to respond with a life of gratitude, and worship, and ready obedience, hands, feet, minds, and hearts, equipped and engaged in your service. We want to be that kind of people. You call us your holy ones, your set-apart people. And you speak to us saying, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. We want to be more like 
you, more like your son. We want to live lives that reflect your beauty in this world where people desperately need to see and be drawn to you. And we pray that you would equip us for that even now, this morning, as we worship, as we read your word, as we hear it proclaimed, as we sing aloud faithful hymns to you. Would you take our thoughts and our affections and therefore our lives and align them with your perfect word. Fix them firmly upon Christ that he might be seen to be the the great and blazing center, the reason we are here, the only one worthy of our complete and utter devotion in all of life. We ask this that you would get glory for we are the people called by your name. And we pray it all in the name of your Son, who is our Savior, who told us when we pray, we should say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, if you would remain standing with me and take a copy of the hymnal, let's open together to number 89 and sing the hymn there titled Amazing Grace, number 89. Beautiful hymn, isn't it? Of course, well known. We probably could have sung it without hymnals. Great thing to be able to sing of our God's amazing grace. That is the foundation of our faith, our hope, our comfort. We praise the Lord for that. It's not our works. We don't go through life saying, well, look at me. Look at the person I am. Look how great I am. I'm surely going to heaven. We go through all of life ever looking time and again to our gracious God and Savior Look at Christ and look at what a Savior he is. Look at the things that he has done for me, how he has fulfilled the law for me by his perfect life, how he has removed the curse from me through his death on the cross. Amazing grace, God's gift, forgiveness, and eternal life. 
in Jesus Christ. That truly is all of our solid hope, all of our comfort. Something that we can confess together this morning. If you look at the uh, fourth page of your bulletin, as we confess our faith together today, using question and answer one from the Heidelberg Catechism. There we are asked, Christian, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. What a beautiful thing to be able to confess all my comfort in life and in death is that I am not my own. I belong body and soul to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He is indeed a faithful Savior, worthy to be praised, and one who does give his people comfort in the face of all the trials and the troubles that we face in this life. We see uh, some of the trials and troubles that his people face, at least an example of them, as we read our uh, scripture reading this morning, which comes to us uh, this morning from the New Testament, Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22. Uh, one of many examples of opposition to the gospel and to the truth in Christ, as we'll also see when we read our sermon text in a moment. Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. This is uh, the word of our God. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem, with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them apart, excuse me, when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. When they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. 
Amen. This is the word of our God. Would you join me as we pray, asking him to help us to understand what is being well communicated to us for our spiritual benefit in those verses, as well as in those that we will read shortly, our sermon text from John 9. Father in heaven, we praise you who are a mighty and a true God. You who are powerful and you who are always faithful. You are at work in all the world accomplishing your purpose. And everything that you do is faithful and upright. So that you are to be praised because of who you are. And you are to be praised because of your wonderful works. And we thank you for examples even like the one in the passage we've just read where you, Lord, by your own great power, do awesome things. Things that even the unbelieving world cannot rightly deny. Demonstrating your existence, demonstrating your might. We praise you, Lord, for the way that you have said that the truth of who you are and what you have done through your Son, this will be proclaimed to every nation under heaven. The word will go forth and try to resist it as many may, yet the gates of hell will will not prevail. The word of God will speed ahead and increase. Many will be added to the church as they believe and are saved. And you will indeed have a people for yourself of every tribe, language, nation. We thank you that you have been faithful to do this these many years. Lord, how angrily the world has raged against the truth raged against your son and and your people who are united to him. And yet, the word has continued to go forward. Your church has continued to expand and to grow. And you receive glory as you continue to gather in your lost sheep, calling them one by one by name so that they hear your voice above all the clamor of the world that they follow you. We thank you for calling us, Lord. You know our sins. You know our unworthiness, Lord. I am a sinful man. We are a a sinful people. And yet you have looked upon us with mercy. You might well have allowed us to continue on in our own way, heading toward our own destruction, but you did not. You sent your Son for us. You sent the Word to us. You, You sent your Spirit to allow us to hear that Word with believing ears. You opened our eyes to see what we would never otherwise have seen. We praise you for this. We praise you, Lord, that you have not called us in believing your Son to leap into the dark, to abandon rationality and truth, but rather to embrace the truth so that we now know you. We we know the truth of who you are and why we are here, where we are heading. And we praise you that you have given us the truth in your word and called us to go and proclaim it and assured us that while many will refuse it, yet there will be those who will believe. You will have your elect. And we pray, Lord, that as we open and look at Acts, excuse me, John 9 this morning, and we, we see the difference between the unbelieving and the believing response to your Son, uh, that we would be encouraged, we would be strengthened, that though the world resists, yet the truth It will pierce and penetrate the hearts of those whom you would have. And we would go forward boldly, courageously proclaiming your Son and the wonderful things that he has done. Lord, strengthen us for this task even now as you grow us in understanding and in love for you who have opened the eyes of the blind. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And well, our sermon text this morning does come to us again from John chapter 9. Uh, We've made it so far through 12 verses in that chapter, so we'll pick up in verse 13. Uh, In the beginning of that chapter, you may recall, we saw a man who had been blind from birth who was healed by the Lord Jesus in a most wonderful way. And our verses pick up after that healing and tell us some of what took place as a result of it, beginning in verse 13. 13, we read from the word of the Lord. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees asked him again, 
how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight, until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, whom you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner or not, excuse me, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Mm, well, this is the word of our God. May he bless us as we contemplate it further together this morning. Looking at this uh, passage, many verses here, we could go in uh, any number of different directions in looking at this passage this morning. And certainly it's been preached from uh, quite a number of angles, looking at it from different perspectives, considering all that it has to say. And there is a lot there. Uh, but among all of the various angles from which we might view it, I want us this morning to focus in on a very stark contrast that is presented to us in our text today. A contrast between the simple but beautiful logic of belief and the profound illogic of unbelief. That is the simple childlike logic of, of faith or belief in the Lord Jesus Christ on the one hand over against the illogic of unbelief on the other. I say the uh, illogic of unbelief because what we find as we work through the interaction in our verses is that uh, unless the Lord breaks in and does something transformative in the mind and the heart, uh, the person who is entrenched in unbelief regarding the truth about God and about his son Jesus Christ, this person will do anything to avoid and to suppress the truth. So that at the end of the day, the, the person who stubbornly persists in unbelief does not do so because they're too smart for religion or because they have strong, solid, intellectually sound reasons for doing so. But in fact, we find just the opposite. They, they refuse to believe in and submit to Christ in spite of all sound reasoning. It's what we see play out as we walk through this uh, back and forth between this blind man who's been made well and this group of men called the Pharisees. They are, you know, the uh, religious leaders of sort in and around Jerusalem. They are uh, well respected and well known by the Jews. Uh, They're honored and obeyed by the Jewish people. And the Bible makes it rather clear as we work through much of the New Testament that, uh, generally speaking, they liked this position. But the Pharisees liked 
the life that they had come to have. They were well-dressed. They were well thought of by their countrymen. They were the uh, elite, if you will, in the land. And they didn't want to give up. And they did not want to change this lifestyle. They certainly did not want to have to surrender the position of authority they'd come to have. They didn't want to have to admit, uh, we've been wrong about quite a number of things, including this man called Jesus. Uh, They didn't want to have to confess themselves sinners and rely on Jesus Christ to save them. And so as they're confronted with Jesus' great power in our verses supporting his claims to be the Messiah sent from God, to be the only way to God, in fact, to be God in the flesh, as they're confronted with his power, they demonstrate for us just how far unbelief is willing to go to avoid facing reality. Their first response to this blind man made well, they reveal unbelief will try, if it can, to discredit the truth wherever it meets it. I'll try to discredit it. Read verses 13 to 17 with me again. They, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, well, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man, what do you say about him? Since he has opened your eyes, and he said he is a prophet. So we're told that there is a division among them. Right? Jesus' word, as he is presented always, divides. Some of the Pharisees are rightly persuaded. This Jesus, whatever he is, must not be some great sinner because he's doing these wonderful signs And God is not going to listen to someone who is a fraud and an imposter and empower him to do such things. So he must not be a great sinner. But you notice what the other Pharisees say in verse 16. This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Is that not an incredible response to what has just occurred? a, A blind man has been healed. As the Old Testament had been prophesying all these years, the Messiah was going to do. So when Christ comes, he's going to open blind eyes, as as only God has the power to do. An incredible miracle has just taken place, a wonderful show of mercy. It's a cause for standing in awe, rejoicing. What is this thing that has happened? But in their sinful resistance to even considering the possibility that Maybe Jesus is the promised one. Maybe we need him. And we're not all right on our own. Instead of considering this truth, which would mean, well, they would have to trust and honor him. You see, they give this almost sort of guttural negative response. But immediately they, they look for some way to discredit him. And so they run to their heavy-handed interpretation of the Sabbath. Rather than uh, remembering texts like Isaiah 58, which declares the Sabbath is supposed to be a blessing, it's supposed to be a day for showing mercy and and for doing good. Well, they claim, no, this man has broken the Sabbath day. He just healed a man, and, and we're going to say that's impermissible work. And so he can't be from God. And therefore, we have our excuse in hand. We don't need to pay him any mind. We don't need to learn from him. We don't have to trust in him. We don't have to begin to follow him. Of course, their their way out of line with Scripture here concerning the actual purpose of the Sabbath day. And, And if they're out of line with Scripture, that means they're out of line with reality. But they don't care. They just sort of lift their noses. They act like they have a good reason for not honoring and obeying the Lord Jesus. They're seeking to discredit him so that they can have a reason to reject him. It's what unbelief does. Rather than humbling itself and listen to the truth and submit to it, it convinces itself that it can actually somehow discredit the truth, that it can refute reality, which is illogic at work. Of course, if this fails, as it must, then we see unbelief will try as best it can to debunk the truth. Couldn't discredit it. Maybe it can debunk it. Look at verses 18 and following. 
the Jews uh, did not believe that he had been born blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? You see the key phrase right there in verse 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight. Now, the earlier portion of chapter 9 revealed this man was well known. Right? When, when he was healed, it became evident all the people around there who were seeing him were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Uh, likely he did this day after day for years on end. So he was well known. There are those in the community who recognized what had happened. They're all abuzz and talking about it. They make such a stir that word gets to the Pharisees so that they call the man in. In other words, everybody out there is saying, this is, he was blind, and now he can see. And then the man himself comes in, the Pharisees interrogate him, and he gives personal testimony. Yes, that is me, just as he told the people outside, I'm the man. It really happened. I was blind, and here I am right before you, seeing. And yet still, we're told, the Jews did not believe. Now why? with the whole community of us and the man himself testifying to it. Well, not because they have any evidence on hand to the contrary, to disprove what he's saying. They don't believe because they don't want to believe. They don't want to believe. So all the evidence is pointing in one direction. It's pointing toward the truth about Christ. He has just done something amazing. They say, we're going to ignore it. And we are going to take a shot at debunking the truth. We're going to try and make this seem ridiculous if we can. And so they call on the man's parents. We can't hear the tone in their voice as they question his parents. It seems likely, based on the whole text, to have been a condescending one. They ask them in verse 19, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? You hear? You say... He was born blind. This is, these are the man's parents, as if you must be either confused or you're lying. How does he now see? As if these parents are supposed to know how a miracle works. Right? As if, based on the Pharisees' behavior, as if these parents could say anything that would persuade the Pharisees of the truth. None of that is reasonable to expect from them. But it doesn't matter because reason is not what the Pharisees are after here. They're not interested in facts. They're not looking for reliable testimony to persuade them. They are interested in somehow convincing themselves they've debunked the truth. Look how ridiculous this is. These, these silly people, how confused they are. So that they themselves, the Pharisees, can go on living in defiance of the Lord. It's what unbelief does when it's faced with the truth. It refuses to be argued into a corner. It says, throw whatever you want at me. I will seek to discredit it if I can. I'll try to debunk it if I can. And if it can't do all that, well, then we find unbelief will try to diminish the truth. That is, to put a basket over it, if you will, to try and at least limit its spread and influence. Uh, keep it from getting out, from becoming widely known. You read verses 20 to 23, and we hear the parents' response. When asked how their son can now see, his parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. And then the parenthetical comment there, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. One thing about the truth is that try as the unbelieving world may to discredit it, to debunk it, it just keeps standing. Because it's the truth. It's true. And, and what remains true remains true regardless of what anyone thinks about it or says about it. It just is. The Pharisees, and of course many in the world today, would uh, love nothing more than to somehow disprove Christ's claims, to show he isn't the Christ. And those people who believe and follow him are ridiculous. They're out of their minds. They're confused. They're lying. They're loonies. 
to show that he did not come from God, that he, he didn't come in the flesh, God among us, that he didn't live a sinless life and do these mighty works that are recorded for us, that it was all a fraud, that he didn't die on a cross or perhaps didn't rise again to somehow prove it all false. But it can't be done. It can't be done. It never has. It never will. Generation after generation, there have been those who have claimed they have somehow undermined Christianity, and yet they have not. The truth remains. And so since they can't falsify Christ's claims, they can't prove that this didn't happen, we find the men in our text have determined we're at least going to limit this thing. We're not going to let it get out. We will diminish its effect. They cannot successfully argue against the truth. I mean, the blind man made well is right there in front of them, and everybody's saying, yeah, that's, that's the man. So they abandon reasoning, evidence-based thinking, and they just start to threaten. Right? They threaten to use force. The man's parents clearly don't want to say very much to the Pharisees, especially nothing too positive about Jesus, and verse 22 says why. They were afraid. Because these religious authorities, with a great amount of sway in the community, had announced, if anybody confesses Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ from God, you're out of the synagogue. Unable to stand against the truth on its own terms, the person who's hardened in unbelief and determined to oppose God and his Christ, as these men are, you see, they decide, well, we'll just threaten anyone who sides with him. We'll shout louder at them. Well, these men threaten excommunication. It's, it's expulsion from the synagogue, the central gathering place in the Jewish community. Right? Be expelled from there, and it's, it's as if you have a mark on you. Right? You are now an outcast among your own family and friends. We can't withstand the force of the facts that are confronting us, and so we're just going to yell louder and start threatening. It's a sure sign that someone is in a weak position. It's the illogic of unbelief. I can't argue. I can't discredit the truth. I've not been able to debunk it. So I'll just try and diminish it, even if I have to threaten, be intimidating. And when all else fails, we find, well, unbelief will try to destroy the truth. You see it in verses 24, following all the way down to verse 34. I won't read that whole long section, but the Pharisees call this uh, healed man back in. They tell him, we know Jesus is a sinner. They're trying to push him into a corner, intimidate him somehow, and he replies by, well, just restating the facts. He says, I I don't know about that, essentially. What I know is, I was blind, he healed me, I see. And they push on. Maybe they're hoping he'll slip up, he'll somehow contradict himself. They ask him again, tell us what he did to you. At which point, you can picture him in this conversation. It's as if he's had it, and he sees a big red button, you know, and he just says, I'm just going to push it and see what happens. Right? So, verse 27, he pushes it. He says, I've told you already. You would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Right? And with that, they've had enough. Right? He's pushed the button. They, they, they are set off. They begin to revile the man. They, they refer to themselves as Moses' disciples. Right? We're the faithful people of God. We're the ones who follow the Lord. Even as they admit, they have no idea where Jesus has come from. We don't know anything about this man or who he is, showing that they're not working with logic and sound reasoning. They're not trying to get the facts together and work based on those. They revile him. In response, the healed man seems to figure, well, he... Might as well push the button again. So he says, verses 30 to 33, why this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God will listen to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. He's using their own logic against them. God only listens to his holy people. He will not listen to a sinner. God's listening to this man, so what do you say? But with that, they're done stumbling around, trying to avoid the force of the facts. They're done making threats. Verse 34, they answered him, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. 
They put him out of the synagogue. They expelled him. They insult him. We talked about that last week. They imply, it's your fault. You were born blind, you wicked man. And then they add injury to this insult when they exile him from the main hub of community life. We cannot disprove what you say. But we don't like it. And so we're going to shut you up by shutting you out. We're going to make you a byword and a stranger in your own community. It's where unbelief eventually has to go whenever it is trying to conquer the truth. It shouldn't surprise us because it cannot overcome the truth in any kind of valid way. It can't stand based upon the facts because all the facts point toward the truth about God, about Christ. So unbelief has to try to blot it out. We see it throughout history and, uh, of course, still in the world today. It's why Christianity and its adherents have so often not just been ridiculed, but violently persecuted. Because the unbelieving heart hates the truth. It does not want to submit to Christ as Lord. It does not want to have to change its lifestyle to be God-centered instead of me-centered. It doesn't want to conform to God's word. It And yet it cannot successfully overcome the truth. So it tries to make it look ridiculous, or to shut it up, or to kill it. Even though that means we're going to have to deny reality, we're going to have to just set facts aside and pretend they're not what they are, and act illogically and irrationally, and lash out, while claiming we're doing the opposite. We see it just one example. There are any number of them. The realm of scientific study today, for example, which really should be, of course, the best friend of the Christian faith because science depends upon truth. That's what it's supposed to be trying to discover. But instead, refusing to acknowledge God or to bow to his son, there are any number of people today, huge numbers in fact, that would insist God did not make the world. God did not create mankind. It somehow generated itself. The Lord is not Lord over us. So you see those pitiful attempts to explain how the universe is here without somebody putting it here. You see a widespread acceptance, for example, of the theory of evolution. Not because that's where genuine scientific inquiry leads, but because believing this sort of thing seems to give permission to live a life free from God's restraint. And the views are pushed, of course, with such fervor that to reject them is to be shoved to the periphery of so-called intelligent discussion, to be looked at as a lunatic or a zealot. Even though, of course, such theories are anything but sound. They're the opposite of sound reasoning and logic because they begin with a basic denial of reality, with God is not there and he did not do this. But nonetheless, they're held with white knuckles by many who would rather believe anything than the truth about God and about Jesus as the only way to him. And you see, playing out right now around us, don't you, the entire plethora of consequences as a result. When you reject basic reality, then you cannot help but run into all kinds of moral and sexual and other consequences. You've denied the true God, and your culture and your lives will not be shaped by the truth. Of course, when shouting falsehood doesn't work, Loud as it may be yelled, those pesky Christians keep going around and, well, telling the truth. Uh, Then we have plenty of examples of people being willing to take harsher measures to avoid bowing before Christ. We read one in Acts chapter 4 this morning. We have uh, Peter and John, and they're threatened. Even as the religious leaders acknowledge, we can't deny what these men are saying. It's clear this crippled man was made well. We can't deny it, so let's just threaten them. Acts 7, when the uh, Jewish leaders, you remember, they, they gnashed their teeth and they, they rushed at Stephen. So angry were they at what he was saying. Christ is Lord and you need to honor him. You've, you've rejected him and you need to turn. And so they stoned him. You see it in China today, churches being burned to the ground. Faithful churches anyway. You see it in parts of Europe today. If you preach on the street in various parts in Europe, you're arrested today. I've seen it in recent weeks in Canada where faithful elders, they were legally charged for holding worship services. 
And we see it in our own land where some states have in recent months had the audacity to make similar threats. Of course, the unbelieving world always comes up with plausible reasons for doing this, don't they? To make it sound intelligent, act like there's an excuse for it. But it's all nonsense. People like to pretend unbelief is an intellectual matter. Some reasonable sounding thing. This is why we're opposing your worship. This is why we're against what you're saying. But the entire position in the end is illogical because it's planted firmly in midair. It's based upon a falsehood that denies God is there. That he has spoken and that we are called to honor him. The truth of his word, the lordship of Christ. It claims to care about truth, but it rejects the God of truth, apart from whom there is no objective truth. The unbelieving heart hates God. The thought of what it would mean to face the facts. And so it seems better to embrace irrationality, to try and deny or destroy this thing, this truth that keeps glowing before me and burning my conscience. Better to destroy this than to acknowledge it and bow before Christ. Now, you know, that takes a massive exertion of the will. Right? Shutting out the light, one has to purposely blind oneself from what is right there. That's just what Paul says in Romans 1, the unbeliever is willing to do, to suppress the truth. Unbelief is willing to do it. If by so doing it thinks it can avoid acknowledging God is there and Christ's claims are true. It's the profound illogic of unbelief. And it couldn't be at greater odds with what we see at work in the once blind man, our verses, which is, well, the logic of belief. The, a simple, childlike faith based on an undeniable reality. You notice, uh, as the unbelieving world assaults the truth, belief may not have an answer to every question. But that's just the way it is, certainly not at first, when a person has just come to know Jesus. It's not that this person should not go on to learn more about God and about Christ. We should. We're supposed to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. But, of course, a baby believer doesn't know much to begin with and doesn't need to know very much. But the man in our text certainly did not. Uh, he, he's grilled by the Pharisees, asking him these questions, and he cannot answer all of them. He, he can recount what happened. He can kind of begin to speculate about who Jesus is, but he can't say how he did what he did. He doesn't have detailed answers for their questions in that sense. He cannot thoroughly answer everything they throw at him, as is the case with many who've just come to know Jesus or who perhaps are just young and growing in their faith. Belief may not have an answer to every question, but that doesn't mean it's illogical or that it's unsound or baseless. Because while it may not know a whole lot, belief does know some things for certain. Right? The man in our text, you see him kind of progressing, feeling his way along, even as he's questioned. He, Jesus is a man. Well, he's a prophet. Well, he must not uh, be a sinner. He must be from God. He's going to go further next week. But he, he's, he's learning. He's already growing. He knows a little bit. And he knows something incredible has happened. Right? He knows he met Jesus only recently. He knows before that he'd been blind his entire life. He knows Jesus did something to him nobody else could possibly do, and that now he's been dramatically changed. He says, verse 25, though I was blind, now I see. And what are the Pharisees going to do or say or threaten to convince him that's not true? I know what has taken place here. Belief may not know everything. It knows some things for certain. And it knows this in spite of all of the so-called reasoning and skepticism and threats, even assaults of the unbelieving world. These Pharisees, you can see them there like a proud modern skeptic, a university professor. They can sit in their nice robes. They can mock him. They can threaten him. But they cannot shake his simple knowledge of the facts. This is who I was. This is what I was like the life I was living. Then I met Jesus Christ, and he did something, and this is who I am now. You can doubt it. They can attack it. All he can respond is, I know it's true. I cannot deny this. More is going to be learned in time, and it should be. 
Right? We grow. We learn answers to some difficult questions. But when a person has truly met Jesus Christ right from the beginning, right, they know something has happened. Right? An unshakable, a glorious reality which to rest in and rejoice in is as logical as anything could ever be. Jesus has done something for me, they say. He's done something within me. He's done something I could never have done on my own. Something nobody else was able to do for me. He opened my eyes and I saw things I've never seen before. I saw God as he, he really is. Holy and pure and, and good. And he showed me myself and all of my, my sin. And then he showed me a savior and himself. And he showed me all of these things in such a way that I really saw and in seeing, I was changed. The believer can say, look, look, there's all kinds of questions I don't have answers to. Questions I have that I've not yet answered. But this much I know for certain. I know what Christ has done. Not because some scholar told me it was reasonable. And not because I can respond to every skeptic's question, but... Because Jesus has shown me he is who his word says he is. He's done for me what his word promised he would do. It's the, it's the simple, sound, beautiful logic of belief. I met Christ. Christ changed me. It's simple. But it's a thousand times stronger than the illogic of unbelief. Which is why the Christian faith has withstood every high-minded assault against it for thousands of years. Not because it's brilliant, but because it's true. Because those who have met Christ, they know it. And nobody can convince them otherwise. So what about you? Can you say that today? I've met Jesus. Has he, has he saved you? Is he changing you? Are you able to rejoice in that simple, sweet reality this morning over against everything the world throws at you, over against all the lies that swirl all around us like dust in our culture, over against all the boasting of some very intelligent but ignorant elites? Over against all this stands the testimony of every true believer. I may not know it all. I may not even know that much. But I know Jesus. Is that your simple, a beautiful, and indeed perfectly logical testimony today? I have met the Son of God. And whatever else is true, I know I'll never be the same. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we praise you that you are a God who saves sinners. That through your Son you have acted in such power that your saving grace is utterly undeniable. When you come to a sinner and you cause your word to meet with faith in the heart, there is no turning around, no going back, no denying that which we have seen, that which has occurred, that Christ has come, he has died, he has risen, and he has saved us and is changing us and keeping us. We praise you for the testimony of this blind man in our text. It must have been so intimidating to stand before the men he'd always known as religious leaders, upstanding men in the community with such power in their hands must have been so intimidating to stand before them and to hear them deriding him and seeking to undermine him. And yet we praise you that by your grace he was able to stand firm and to say, I was blind, but now I see. And that not all the boasting and shouting and threatening and assaults of the unbelieving world could ever overcome such a simple but powerful and unshakable testimony. Lord, in our world we see uh, increasing reviling of your children, increasing rebelling against your word and anger toward those who believe it and profess faith in Christ and follow him. Would you make us, Lord, like this man in our text with a simple childlike faith 
not that we desire to be ignorant or unknowing. We want to grow in knowledge as you commend and call us to do. But help us, Lord, no matter what assault comes, to be able to stand firm and say, I know this much. I know the Lord Jesus. And no one can tear me from his grasp. And as he holds me firm, no one will get me to say otherwise. Christ is Lord, and I praise his holy name forever and ever. Lord, strengthen your church with such a testimony and get glory as you use it to draw still others to the truth. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, may grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus with love incorruptible. Amen.